Okay, so we uh, finished the last lect lecture with the network construction process. Now, in order to finish the whole chapter about Bayesian networks, um, we just for a moment look at it a little more formally and more general. Um, yeah. We want to talk a little bit about the semantics of Bayesian networks, which is, of course, very important. Um, and we look at um, three different constellations of three nodes, A, B, and C. Yeah? If we have, I mean, suppose this is a part of a network. Yeah? Um, if these two variables, A and B, are connected to C only via these uh, two uh, directed uh, uh, edges, then A and B are independent. If it looks like this, then A and B are independent given C, and in this case too. Uh, A and B are independent given C, given the middle node. Okay, now um, uh, we need some other requirements for a Bayesian network to have a well-defined semantics. First is that the, uh, the network uh, can have no cycles. Huh? Um, I mean, this is due to the, the causality interpretation. I mean, if, if we have um, one node A and a node B, and we have something like that, um, then such a cycle in, in the interpretation of the network causes real problems. Huh? Um, I mean, this is like A is, a, is a, a reason for B, and B is at the same time a reason for A, and, and then we get such an infinite uh, cycle um, which does not work for directed Bayesian networks. Um, yes, and also we talked about the variable order. We have to start with the causes and then number our variables in a causal way. Yeah? And therefore, if we do this, then no variable has a lower number than any variable that precedes it. That's the definition of the order. Huh? Okay, so if, if, this, uh, if this holds, the, the variables are ordered in a causal order, then this equality holds. Look, what, we have, what do we have on the left-hand side? We have the conditional probability P of Xn given all other variables X1 through Xn minus 1. Yeah? And now, if you think of the chain rule, what would the chain rule say? Maybe we, we, we should write it down on the board. Now, what is the train rule? P of <coughs> I mean, the, the train rule was actually about P of x uh, 1 xn is equal to so first we start with the product huh? and then this product goes over i equal 1 through what was it n or n minus 1 do you have it here? It's n, yeah, okay. Okay, and then, now in this product, we have only conditional probabilities. Huh? 
So this is the product of P of xi given, now what, given all other variables with smaller numbers. Given um, x1 through xi minus 1. Is that how we have it here? Yes. Okay. That's how we get the, the conjunctive combination of all variables. Yeah? Okay, and what do we have here? Um, yes, um, P of xn given all the others. Yeah. Yeah, let, let's let's start doing the calculation p of x1 comma xn. And now we take this this last variable xn out. So this is p of xn given x1 xn minus 1 times p of x1 to xn minus 1. Huh? Yes. And now we can, we can take this guy and uh, apply our product rule again. And then we would introduce a next conditional probability and so on. Huh? Um, now what, what did I want to say? Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, okay, yeah. So wh what we, um, this formula is a special variant of this formula, but I mean it is general formula. I have to take the condition, so I have to condition xi, or let's go look here. We have to condition xn on all the other variables with smaller numbers. On all variables with a smaller number. Uh, but in this formula, on the left hand side, we condition on all variables with a smaller number. But if we have a Bayesian network, we do not need to condition on all variables with a smaller number. We can, we can erase all of them which are not immediate predecessors, which are not parents <coughs> of our variable xn. Yeah? So if we, for example, look at this example, then we can immediately say, for example, let's take P of John uh, given um, alarm um, burglary and earthquake, for example. Um, then we can write this as P of John uh, given alarm. We can just omit these two guys. Huh? And this is because John is conditionally independent 
from burglary give an alarm. Yeah. And John is conditionally independent from earthquake give an alarm. And because of these conditional independence assumptions, we can omit all variables but the, the parent variables. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, therefore, this, uh, yeah, this conclusion holds that a node in a Bayesian network is conditionally independent from all non-successor nodes given its parents. Um, yeah, I mean this is a little bit a, differ, a difficult formulation but you will immediately see why we need it in this way. So look at this uh, picture. Here we have uh, a node A and now we interpret this theorem. A node, this node A is conditionally independent from all non-successor nodes. So non-successor nodes. So it's conditionally independent from, for example, B1 or P, B2 or this here, given its parents. These are the two parents. Huh? So A is conditionally independent of B1 given these two. Huh? Or conditionally independent of B3 given these two. Yes. And also it is conditionally independent for example uh, from B6 given E2. And it is conditionally independent from B8 given E2. Yes. Um, what th this um, this blue um, part of the graph here, that's what we call the so-called Markov blanket. Huh? So all the nodes outside this Markov blanket, uh, these are the nodes which are conditionally independent to this node A uh, given its parents. Ja. Ah, das ist auch scheiße. So. Okay, and uh, from this now we can get a, a modified, a, a, a much simpler, nicer chain rule for Bayesian networks. So for the, for the whole conjunction of all variables, um, I mean this is the ordinary chain rule which we just had. Yeah? Um, and now, um, here in the condition we need all variables with a smaller number. Huh? So all variables that may be a cause of variable xi. Okay, and because of the conditional independence we just have to use the parents here. Sorry, uh, of course it must be parents. Okay, yeah. Okay, and uh, I mean this is an equation we had before. Uh, probability for John, uh, burglary and alarm can be easily written in this form. We actually derived this formula uh, by using some conditional independence assumptions, but we could have written it down immediately using this formula. Huh? Um, John is the variable with the highest index. Uh, um, so we can write this as P of John given um, 
its uh, parents and John has only one parent which is alarm. Uh, so we only need alarm here and then we have a product so we have to multiply this with P of alarm um, given all its parents times P of burglary given all its parents and burglary has no parents anymore. But, uh, yeah, what is your objection now? Why is it uh, alarm in burglary and not alarm in burglary and earthquake? Yeah, why don't we have earthquake here? The answer is simple, because we don't have earthquake <coughs> here. Um, look here. So we are, we are now uh, considering this world. In this world we only have these three variables, which are John, Alarm and Burglary. This is the world we are looking at at the moment. Huh? And there are uh, no earthquake and no Mary variables. I mean we can always do this Look, I mean, if we use these five variables, do we consider the variable uh, air pressure or air temperature outside or air temperature inside or whatever? I mean, I mean, there are infinitely other, many other variables which we could consider, but we do not. So, it, of course, we can look at this network at only a part of this network by just neglecting all the other variables. If I'm only interested in these three variables, I can just neglect all the others. Huh? Maybe I need earthquake in order to compute some, some values. For example, um, the CPT for alarm, of course, includes the earthquake uh, variable. And therefore, maybe I need earthquake in order to compute P of alarm. But we can, we can neglect a variable and then, uh, I mean, here I just want to know uh, uh, the, the joint distribution of these three variables and then I apply this formula and that's what I get. Okay, yeah, now, now we can summarize what we found about Bayesian networks. So the definition of a Bayesian network is of course, we need a set of variables, a set of directed edges between these variables. Um, each variable has finitely many possible values. I mean, that's why we only consider discrete, finite discrete variables. The variables together with the edges form a directed acyclic graph. Uh, yeah, uh, acyclic is important because we don't rely on cycles. Um, and okay, yeah, this is just about what a cycle is. Uh, for every variable a in a, in the CPT, um, the probability p of a given all its parents um, is entered into the table. Okay, then we do have the, this notion of conditional independence um, and we have two equivalent formulations um, yeah. and of course we need the Bayesian theorem. Then we have the, the marginalization formula and uh, so marginalization is if I want to eliminate a variable and conditioning is the formula for introducing new variables. Okay. Um, yes, and uh, a variable in a Bayesian network is conditionally independent of all non-successor variables given its parent variables. That's what we just had. Um, and if x1 through xn minus 1 are no successors of xn, which is by construction 
then we have p of xn given all its predecessor variables, then we just have to look at the parents. Huh? This condition must be honored during the construction of a network. That's very important. Okay. Um, yeah, and also that I mentioned it, when you construct a network, you should uh, consider cons uh, causality. Otherwise, uh, it's getting really inconvenient. Okay, and we have the train rule. Yeah, okay, yeah, and I mean, there is also a notion called de-separation, which is um, theoretically a little bit nicer and more general, but it's uh, also <coughs> much more difficult, and that's why we don't introduce this. Yeah? We talk about conditional independence, and that's for our purposes enough. Um, yes, so a summary. Um, yeah, with our probabilistic logic, we can uh, reason, do reasoning under uncertain knowledge. Um, we looked at the maximum entropy method, we introduced Bayesian networks, and it's very important, Bayesian networks are a special case of max end. Yeah? Special case, that means if we do have independence assumptions, then we can just write down our, our Bayesian network, we can redefine our variables, and due to the conditional independence, we can draw our edges. Um, yes. <coughs> but, uh, I mean, the question is, for example, let's, let's look at this example again. Um, If we know about all our conditional independences, and they are like we had it here, then we know how we have to fill our CPTs. That's a nice procedural, uh, it's kind of an algorithm how you can construct your network. But now suppose, due to some reason, we have some knowledge about these variables and nothing else. Maybe we know these two CPTs and these priors, but maybe we do not know this CPT. Then there is no chance um, working with the Bayesian network theory. It doesn't help us. We can compute almost nothing. But we can work with Maxent. We can just put the knowledge we have into MaxEnd as constraints and then compute the MaxEnd solution and we will get the best solution under these constraints. But with the Bayesian network there is no chance. So MaxEnd of course is much more general. You can apply MaxEnd always. Whenever you have some, some knowledge you can apply MaxEnd but uh, Bayesian network only if you have these CPTs and you know the structure. Okay, yeah, all CPTs must be filled completely in a Bayesian network. Oh yes, and also in, in MaxEnd, uh, a really nice advantage is you can enter probability intervals. Huh? So even if you do not know the probability values, but you maybe just know such an interval, then you can enter the, uh, the interval. Okay, yeah, and uh, we talked about inconsistency, inconsistency, which is, I mean, of course, a probability value cannot be at the same time two different values. Uh, this, this is an inconsistency and our PIT system even recognizes inconsistencies. 
in, in Bayesian networks, they are, not a, they, are, they are excluded. You have to enter the, pro, the CPTs, and of course you can only enter one number in one slot of a uh, CPT. Okay, yes. Um, yeah. It might even be interesting to combine Max and, and uh, Bayesian networks. For example, we start building up our Bayesian network like this, and then we have to enter all the values into the CPTs, but maybe some values are, are unknown. Maybe we do not know the probability for burglary. The easiest thing we can do is we just omit this value. And then we cannot use Java base, but we can use Maxent. Or we could enter a probability interval for burglary. We could say, okay, P of burglary is less than um, 0 0.01. And then apply Maxent. What is, I mean, what is the advantage of combining Bayesian networks and Maxent? Yeah, the advantage, if you use Maxent, Maxent does not come with a procedure telling you, you should start with the causal variables, you should look at conditional independencies, and so on. So the Bayesian network formalism gives you a procedure how you have to proceed in developing your network structure. So why don't you start with this procedure and look how far you get and maybe you are not able to fill all the CPTs and then you can switch to Maxent. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's look at uh, LexMate again. Um, <coughs> now knowing about Maxent and Bayesian networks and so on. We compared LexMate to linear score systems. Do you remember what a linear score is? That's what the physicians um, had all the time. Um, a linear score computes a linear combination of all the symptoms and then we get some number, and then we do a, just a, thre a threshold decision. If the number is bigger than six, then uh, it is appendicitis, otherwise not. No? Um, and it can be shown that these linear scores, mathematically, they are equivalent to the naive base. Naive base is uh, an even simpler variant of Bayesian networks where we assume all variables um, except the diagnosis to be independent. And that's interesting. That's quite interesting to know. Uh, so if we, yeah, we should go back to our LexMate network here. Naive phase applied to LexMate would mean we keep all these edges between the diagnosis on the, and the symptoms, but we would delete all these outer um, edges. That means no dependency among these uh, symptom variables. No dependencies. All symptoms are independent. And that's what we then call naive base. And so you see these scores that are uh, still used in medicine, they are extremely simple because they assume everything is independent. Huh? Yeah. Okay, and LexMate can learn knowledge out of data. 
uh, from a database. We we talked about this already. Um, yeah, Outlook. Bayesian inference is very important in AI nowadays. And I mean, what we did here was only a extremely basic introduction. But Bayesian networks uh, or Bayesian decision theory, Bayesian reasoning is so important in AI, not just for such uh, discrete variables. It is being used for continuous variables nowadays. And now if you have a continuous variable, you always have to talk about uh, continuous distributions like normal distributions, binomial distributions, and so on. Um, and then mathematics is getting uh, more difficult. Um, yes. And this Bayesian reasoning is not just used if you if you have your uh, application variables here. Bayesian reasoning, for example, in the theory of neural networks, people use Bayesian reasoning in order to determine the weights of your neural network. Then you have conditional probabilities, probability for given for a set of weights given my training data and so on. But I mean we will we will come back to this in the in the chapter uh, machine learning which is actually the next chapter. Okay, yes, we, did, we talked about causality in Bayesian networks and causality <coughs> is strongly related to our directed edges. Because of causality, uh, we do have directed edges. But there is a, well, kind of a dual theory, another theory of Bayesian networks where they only have undirected Bayesian networks. So no more directions and now the Bayesian community really now is, t is two parts. There is this community of the directed network people and of the undirected network people and there is an ongoing discussion since, uh, since many years, maybe 20 years, about this topic of causality. This is a philosophical question. Is there causality in this world or is there no causality? Are there causal relations between variables or are there no causal relations? I mean, in this example, it's quite obvious that there should be some causal relation, causal relation between burglary and alarm, for example. Huh? Um, maybe for these two variables it's not so obvious. Huh? Um, and these people dealing with undirected Bayesian networks, they say, okay, why do we worry about causality? We just define undirected networks. The mathematics is quite similar, but it's different. Um, so the advantage of undirected networks is you don't have to bother about ca causality. Huh? And this is a, a severe problem sometimes. For example, in medicine. Uh, in medicine, quite often, we do not know what is the reason and uh, what is the result. Uh, how is it in appendicitis? Yeah, you never know. Maybe the appendix is inflamed because you had a stomach ache. Are you sure that it's not the other way around? I don't know. I mean, it looks like there is this inflamed appendix and this causes your stomach ache. But sometimes it may even be the other way around. You have extreme stomach ache and this causes the appendix to inflame. I guess in, in this case uh, the physicians, they know what happens. But in some cases you don't know what's the reason and what's the effect. Okay, but dealing with undirected uh, Bayesian networks, 
<coughs> of course has the disadvantage that they do not exploit the causality and sometimes the networks may be much more difficult and not so easy to read. Okay, yeah, so what else about this area? Yeah, maybe you should have at least heard these names. I already talked about Pearl and then Jensen is one of these people from Aalborg which developed this uh, Hugin uh, Bayesian network software. Then there is Whittaker, he wrote a nice book about statistical reasoning. Maybe it's among these books here. I don't know. It should actually be here. But I can't see it. Maybe it's here in the mathematics books. No. Um, Duda Hart Stork, this, this should be here. Pattern classification and scene analysis, that's what it's called. This is a nice book either, quite similar. Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning by B uh, Bishop. Um, yeah. And these, these fields of machine learning and Bayesian reasoning, they get more and more close together. For example, in this book, a large part of this book is about Bayesian reasoning. Okay, maybe I should mention the Association for Uncertainty in Artificial Intelligence. Um, and they have a conference every year called the UAI. Okay, yeah, and that's it about Bayesian networks. Are there any questions? I mean, it's up to you now to do the exercises and maybe then some questions uh, will come up. Okay, now let's enter this next uh, chapter called Machine Learning and Data Mining. Uh, why do we have Machine Learning and Data Mining in one chapter? Because the methods that we use for Machine Learning and for Data Mining are actually the same. Huh? Um, yes, and, and we will see what's the difference between Machine Learning and Data Mining. Let's start with uh, Machine Learning. Why do we need Machine Learning in AI? Uh, I mean, the answer is quite simple. If we look at my famous, my, my favorite uh, definition of AI from Elaine Rich, AI is the study of how to make computers do things at which at the moment people are better. Huh? That's my uh, kind of pragmatic definition of AI. And now, one of the things where people are better at the moment is learning. We are able to learn almost everything um, quite autonomously, but uh, computers are not yet, <coughs> at least not very good. And therefore, machine learning is an extremely important area of AI. Okay, yeah, why do we need machine learning? Where do we need it? I mean, another reason or another view of the whole thing is that especially in robotics or other fields where we need autonomous agents, the software for controlling such agents becomes more and more uh, complex, extremely complex and almost no programmer or in some applications nobody is able to write an optimal or even close to optimal program. Um, yes, so the solution is at the moment a hybrid software where parts of the software are programmed, those parts that we can program, of course, we, we may do it. Um, but these other parts where it's too complex, we just use learning algorithms or we try to use them. Okay, now let's look at these four 
learning problems, learning vocabulary of a foreign language, memorizing a poem, acquisition of mathematical skills, learning skiing. Now, yeah, you may think back to school, which one of these were hard for you and which one uh, are easy for you. For me, actually, the, the, the most difficult were, were these two. Huh? But how is it for the computer? It's just the other way around. For the computer, this is trivial. It's just writing the vocabulary into a file and then it never will forget it again. Huh? Or, uh, I, mean, I mean, memorizing a poem. It's trivial, just filing it. Huh? But this is the, the difficult part. Why is this difficult for the computer? I mean, you can, you can write down a formula and store it in a file, <laughs> but that doesn't mean the computer is able to, to interpret it, to apply it. No? And maybe you could write a book about how, how to, to, uh, to be a good skier and filing this in the computer, but that wouldn't help very much. So you, you, you really have to, to transfer the knowledge into actions, into policies which uh, this computer can then apply. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean this, uh, this uh, picture is about learning. Huh? And it is about machine learning because these guys sitting here are supposed to be machines. Yeah? And maybe um, in the future there will be such a class of robots and maybe in the first step a human teacher standing here and teaching these robots. That's actually what we do in the, in the lab next door. We do learning from demonstration and a human trainer shows the robot what to do and then the robot uh, tries to learn this. And maybe at uh, some uh, second or third or fourth stage, uh, these robots are so smart that the human teacher is not smart enough to teach them. So maybe then the robot teacher will teach the little robots. Um, and uh, one step further, maybe there is the robot teacher and here uh, the human kids are sitting. <laughs> you never know. But this is, I mean, uh, I have no idea uh, whether this uh, will come true. Okay, yeah, let's start with an, uh, a nice little example. Um, oh, where do we have this picture? Here, this picture. This is a, um, a picture from, uh, I guess it's in Langen Algen, an, um, such an apple sorting machine. These apples, they, uh, I mean, uh, this machine, it's, it's all filled with water and these apples, they just swim in this water and they come in these rows and here somewhere there is some sensors and these sensors they look at each individual apple and then they will be sorted into different classes. Now suppose we just want to sort our apples into the good ones and the bad ones, into uh, two classes. Huh? And suppose this machine here has two sensors. One is a color sensor which measures the color let's say from green to red on this one axis and um, and there are also maybe there is a scale or some uh, sensor that uh, can measure the size or the weight of the apple and now we draw one point in this diagram for each apple huh? And then we get such a distribution of points in this two-dimensional 
uh, world of Apple measurements. And now suppose there is a human expert. This human expert may be the person that was sitting here before they had this machine. Before they had the, this machine, there were people who just had to do uh, the classification of apples into good and bad. Now suppose we asked such people about which class it is, and then the, the good apples are the green dots and the, the bad apples are the red dots. Huh? And now we can see what's a good apple or what, and what's a bad apple. I mean the good ones are roughly those above this line here and the bad ones are the guys below this line. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, this it's not a straight line. It's, um, so it would be a line looking like this. And now, uh, we want to have a computer program that separates the good apples from the bad apples. So we have actually, we only have to implement this line in our computer. Yeah? And then there is such an if statement. If my current measurement is above this line, it is a class A apple, otherwise it's class B. Yeah? So that's quite simple. And we don't need uh, any machine learning techniques. We just plot our data points in this graph, and then we manually, that's what I just did, and then you need some computer graphics software that does an, uh, an if then else based on this line, uh, which is quite simple. But why can't we stop here at this point and I tell you, okay, that's what machine learning is and you know, you know it now. Why is this not sufficient? At least for classification problems. Dimensions, we can't draw a line. Yeah, that's the point. That's basically it. If we have 17 dimensions, nobody can draw this picture. And therefore, for 17 dimensions, we need something that automatically constructs such a. Yeah, in 17 dimensions, it's no, it's no longer a line. It is a a 16 dimensional subspace of my seven uh, no it's sorry it's it's not a subspace it's a 16 dimensional subset of my space yeah so for those who are in the math lecture uh, a subspace is a vector space and the vector space must include the origin and you see this red line does not include the origin, so it cannot be a subspace. So it's a subset of my uh, space. Um, and this, of course, has to be found automatically because in higher dimensions, we humans have no chance in understanding what's going on. Yeah? Okay, yeah. Yeah, now we have to distinguish between classification and approximation because these are basically the two classes of uh, applications for machine learning. A classifier maps a feature vector to a class value, which may be class A or B of the apples. And there is um, a finite number of different classes and typically this number is small. So maybe two classes, maybe five, maybe ten, but not uh, a million. Uh? And in approximation, we map a feature vector to a real number. For example, maybe we want to estimate the weight of the apple. Uh? And the weight may be any number 
between zero and infinity. Or, yeah, here is an example, forecasting the, the share prices out of a given set of feature values. Okay, now the classical uh, computer science view of our learning agent. What do we want for these apples? We want to have such a program that whenever I input the color and the size, it outputs which class they belong to. Huh? I mean, that would be classically, you would just write a, um, a piece of program uh, source code and that's it. But when we do machine learning, then this agent, this program, must be able to modify itself based on previously seen instances, based on data. Look, yeah, if we have this here, this, this is our training data. And what's very important here now, these training data must already be classified. Some human trainer must classify them in good and bad. And that's what we call supervised learning. In supervised learning, there must be some class label um, on our data. Okay, and when we use these classified training data, then the agent should be able to modify itself such that the class it outputs is hopefully optimal. Okay, now the same picture, a little bit more general, n input features, a set of training data, and it outputs a class label or a desired function value. Okay, now we can uh, start with a formal definition of machine learning. Um, so that's what um, Tom Mitchell in his book about machine learning, and this book definitely is here. Yeah, maybe we should, um, where, here we have machine learning. This is the book, Tom Mitchell, machine learning. Sorry. Just put it up. Machine learning is the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. Yeah, that's a nice definition. I put it a little bit more detailed. An agent is a learning agent if it improves its performance. And what does performance mean? I mean, we have to define a suitable performance criterion. Huh? Improves its performance if we talk about the apples, performance would, uh, would mean that the number of misclassified apples should be as small as possible. Huh? Improves its performance on new unknown data over time. And that's very important, on new unknown data. I mean, if I give my agent 10 apples for training, and then afterwards I take one out of these 10 apples and ask him, is this apple good or bad, then it's just rote learning. It's learning by heart. It just looks into his database and he oh, he sees, oh, this guy, I had it already before. Uh, so you see this new unknown data, this involves generalization. I have seen only 10 apples, and from these 10 apples, I should be able to classify infinitely many. And that's the power of learning. That's the power of learning. You have seen a finite sample of training data, and from this finite sample, we have to be able to classify infinitely many objects. So it's an induction from a finite training set to an infinite set of all possible objects or all possible inputs. Huh? Okay. 
okay, some terms. Yeah, I, we just skip this slide. We go to. Um, oh no, sorry. Um, yeah. I mean, the, these terms are the task, of course, in the, in the example of our apples, the task is classifying apples. The performance measure, we already talked about this. Then, uh, yeah, this is very important, a variable agent. Now, what are the, the variables of my agent that can be adjusted? I mean, it depends on the application and it depends on the algorithm. The most general view we might have is that we just have an empty black box. There is nothing inside. In my agent is just empty. And then we might expect, okay, this agent has to invent some uh, program source code, some C code or Java code, but you can just forget this. I mean, this is an area which it's called genetic programming, and this is something like 30 years old, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You cannot expect um, an, an intelligent software that, that just invents some source code. Just forget it. Yeah? So what we have here are the variables in the agent. We have some fixed source code, but a set of open parameters, like in a neural network. There are the weights of the connections in the network, and these weights, which are just numbers, these weights, they are being adjusted in a way such that the performance finally uh, will be optimal. Okay, and then, of course, we have the training data and we have the test data, and that's very important. I already mentioned, if we look back at the definition, on new unknown data. And these new unknown data, these are the test data. Um, and it's very important that we use a set of training data, maybe 1,000 apples to train our classification machine. And then, when, when training is finished, we use some new unknown previously to the machine unknown test data in order to test the performance. Okay, yeah, now back to this question, what is data mining? Um, yeah, so it's mining in data. Here you see we have a heap of bits, ones and zeros. And now the question is, how do we get this knowledge out of this heap of bits? Let's talk about an example. Um, many companies use data miner no mining nowadays in order to get knowledge out of consumer uh, profiles. Amazon, for example. Whenever you uh, go shopping at Amazon, they store many uh, features about what you have done, what you have been shopping there, and so on. And then maybe they want to conclude about what they would recommend you next time when you go shopping there. Huh? Um, or maybe... Um, such a company like the Otto Versand or Konrad, who send catalogs to all their customers, they want to know what type of catalog should I send to this customer and which one should I send to that customer in order to um, minimize cost and in order to optimize the number of products these cust customers will buy next time. Um, and so they, they collect lots of data. They know, okay, at that time of the day, maybe at uh, one o'clock in the morning, um, somebody has been shopping at Amazon, and uh, he has been online for five minutes and he bought this book of that type and whatever data you have. And Amazon collects 
millions or zillions of data every day. So they have huge databases and then uh, they want to call, and, and of course we, c we can call this training data. Because they know about all the features of, you, uh, of your shopping event and they know what you bought. So it might be interesting to predict what this customer might want to buy next time or to know what this customer might be interested in in order to send him an advertisement or an email, whatever. No? Um, and this is, this is basically the same thing we did with our apples. No? This is machine learning. We need machine learning techniques in order to predict what the customer would buy next time, for example. Okay, so the task is basically the same. But the difference is, one difference is in data mining, very often the size of this heap of training data is much, much larger than it is in typical machine learning tasks. Uh, this, this, the, the number of training data samples in data mining may be really millions or billions and therefore they need algorithms which are extremely fast. Uh, um, this is one property and second it turns out that these companies uh, for data mining uh, applications, the, the type of knowledge they want to know is quite simple. So they can actually work with very simple algorithms. I, uh, yeah, I attended uh, last year um, the, uh, the ICML, the International Conference on Machine Learning, and they had, meanwhile, it's always the ICML together with the data mining conference at the same site. Uh -huh. And I visited a couple of data mining sessions and I was quite surprised about how simple the, uh, these algorithms are that these data mining people use. And inside these sessions, they are really talking about uh, extremely sophisticated details of these simple algorithms. So what I learned from these sessions is that data mining now, I wouldn't call it a, a research anymore, I would call it an engineering discipline. It's about engineering. It's about how can we make this extremely simple algorithm a little bit faster on next dream amounts of data. Yeah? That's really an, uh, an engineering discipline and it is, of course, it's applied. It's applied. Uh, all the, the big internet companies, they use data mining techniques to analyze their uh, customer data and profiles. Okay, yeah. I think we can omit this. Oh, yeah, maybe we should just look at this point here. This is a very nice book, Witten and Frank, Data Mining, Hansa Verlag. It should be here. Let me see. No. Oh, maybe I should mention. What we have here is the semester apparat for AI. Um, th those books with the red label, they are semester apparat. But of course, you can't look at the others too. Most of them are AI related. And uh, all professors can have a semester apart in the library, um, but I moved my semester apart. Most of the professors in Fachhochschule, they do not have. Maybe there are two or three semester apart from Fachhochschule. This is one of them. A semester apart is a collection of books for a, a certain topic, and I moved, I was successful to move this collection here, so for you it's quite easy to look at these AI books and uh, you are welcome to enter this room and read these books. You just have to ask us to open the room. Okay, yeah. And this is a nice book about data mining and uh, these two guys, Witten and Frank, they are Australian AI researchers 
and they developed a Java library of data mining and machine learning algorithms. Um, yeah, it's the it's the Veka library. Veka. This is, I would say, the most popular machine learning library uh, that exists at the moment. Um, and it's open source, um, so whenever you need uh, simple machine learning algorithms, just use this library so you don't have to program it. Okay, yeah. Now, we, before we enter uh, the machine learning uh, topic, Let's talk about data analysis, yeah? because it really makes sense to look at your <coughs> training data before you apply your algorithm, because you can learn a lot about the variables. And now we, uh, we use our LexMate example. Yeah? Um, and here we have a description of the variables. There are 16 variables starting from age and uh, the gender, uh, the pain quadrants and so on, down to our diagnosis variable appendicitis. Here you see whether it's a continuous or a discrete variable. Appendicitis here is only a binary variable. Um, oh, sorry. Huh? What's that? Uh. Okay, yeah. And now, um, one training sample is just a vector consisting <coughs> of these 16 numbers. So, this is the age, and this is whether the appendix was inflamed in this case or not. This, for example, is the leukocyte value, and such a file uh, uh, containing training data would, for example, consist of lines with comma-separated values of all variables. Huh? So this would be patient number one, patient number two, and so on. And we call such a vector x. Huh? Now, yeah, look here. x, p, so uh, p I. P means the number of patterns, so X2, X2, um, 14, for example, would be this leukocyte value. So this would be the lower index here. Okay, and now when we analyze these data, the simplest statistical parameter is the mean. So we could look what is the mean uh, leukocyte value, for example, and that's the formula. We could look at the standard deviation, which might be quite interesting. And, uh, and here it really starts uh, becoming interesting, the covariance. The covariance, sigma ij. Covariance is defined for two variables. So we could look at the covariance between uh, fever and leukocyte value, for example. And what is that? It's the number over all training data, xpi minus xi bar. So this is the, the distance from the actual value to the mean. Uh, so how far is my leukocyte value from the mean? And this will be multiplied with the distance of my fever value from the mean. So, for example, if in this patient here the leukocyte value is higher than the average and the fever is higher than the average too, then this will be a product of two positive numbers. Yeah? Uh, and if this is the case for all patterns, then the covariance will be positive. Okay? If for all patterns the leukocyte value is higher than the mean and the fever is smaller than the mean, then I would have a positive number times a negative number and the covariance would be negative. Yeah? So positive covariance of two variables means 
um, they tend into the same direction. So if the fever is high, then the <coughs> leukocyte value is high too. Such a conjunction do I have between these two variables. And if it's negative, then it's the other way around. Okay, um, now we can normalize the covariance. We use the sigma ij, which is the covariance between variables i and j, and divide it by the standard deviation of variable i times the standard deviation of variable y. And it's easy to prove that uh, what we get here is the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient is normalized. Uh, that means a correlation can only take on values between minus 1 and plus 1. Huh? And if the correlation is zero, then there is no a strong dependency between the two variables. If it is one, then there is a positive cor correlation. And if it is uh, an extremely strong positive correlation, and if it's minus one, a negative correlation. And what we have here is the correlation matrix uh, for these 16 Lexmate variables. Huh? And, I mean, what you see immediately is that in the diagonal, we have ones. Why? Why are all diagonal elements in the uh, correlation matrix equal to one? These are obviously the KII. So that's about the correlation of a variable with itself. And of course, every variable is positively correlated with itself. If I increase the variable, then I increase the variable. And that's why all the diagonal elements are one. Now look at, let's look at some others. You see positive and negative entries. And, um, yeah, let's look where we find um, high absolute values. Uh, for example, here. Here we have 0.44, which is much higher than most of them. Maybe it's the highest even. So now, this is variable 14, the correlation between variable 14 and 16. What was 14 and 16? Oh, here. Yeah. Leukocytes and appendicitis. That's what I told you before. Leukocyte value is very important for appendicitis diagnosis. And um, you can, we can immediately see here, from this correlation, we can conclude when we know the leukocyte value, we have quite a bit knowledge about appendicitis. So if we look at this last column, this last column is just the correlation of all variables with uh, appendicitis. So if we would be forced to build an expert system with, based on one variable only, then this last column would tell us which variable we would like to use. And of course we would use this one because it's the maximum. Oh, this one is quite high too, which is number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9. Number 9 is quite high too. And then we have number 7 and number 10. Okay. 9, 7, and 10. 9 is rebound tenderness. 7 is local guarding. And 10 is pain on tapping. So these are all these pain symptoms where the doctor somehow presses on the abdomen and ask the patients whether there is some pain. So these symptoms obviously are very relevant for appendicitis too. 
You see, we can learn something about our data, about uh, from our data about the the variables. Yeah? And now all the rest here. What can we learn from this? Yeah, we can, for example, see whether two variables are correlated. For example, here we have a 0.28, which is a quite a high correlation, and this is variable number 2467 and 8, 9, 10. 7 and 10. Ah, yeah, these are two of, of these abdomen pain symptoms. And there is correlation, so or let's say there is redundancy among these variables, and so maybe you could, we could uh, remove one of these two variables. Seven, we we could ch uh, just use one of these two. Okay, yeah, and what we have here is, this is just a graphical uh, illustration of these values. Huh? Uh, it's the same matrix, and uh, so such a square is bla black if the correlation is negative, and it's white if the correlation is positive. Huh? And for example, here we see this is the positive correlation of leukocyte value with appendicitis. Um, and on this right uh, figure, we have um, if there is no correlation, the absolute value is zero, then it's black, and if there is a correlation, no matter whether negative or positive, we have a white. Uh, I mean, in this picture, we can really see which, cor uh, which variables are correlated. Yeah. So correlation analysis uh, qu quite often is very helpful. Oh yeah, maybe I should say one more word. What we <coughs> considered here are only pair correlations, correlations of two variables. This can be generalized to higher order correlations, correlations of three variables, four variables, four, five variables, um, which might be interesting too. But this is, I mean, here for the pair correlations we already have a two-dimensional matrix. For the triple correlations it's a three-dimensional matrix and uh, of course we, we, we do have then 16 times 16 times 16 different triple correlations and it's getting harder to analyze it. Okay, now let's look at the simplest machine learning algorithm. A nice and simple. Is it the simplest? Let's say one of the simplest. The Perceptron. Um, the Perceptron is a linear classifier. If we look at this two-dimensional representation of a set of training data, positive, uh, so cl uh, th this is the, the class of positive data and this is the class of negative data and as you can see these two classes can be linearly separated. Huh? So they can be separated with a straight line. And um, the equation for this dividing straight line is of this uh, form. Huh? Any straight line can be brought into this form. So x1 and x2 are the two variables here, and a1 and a2 are two parameters which, of course, have to be adjusted for our straight line. Yeah. And these points where this line crosses our axis are 1 over a2 and 1 over a1. 
And as you can see here from this formula, what is our machine learning task? Our machine learning task is use the training data and determine these two parameters, A1 and A2. That's what we have to do. Determine, how must we, how do we want to determine these parameters? I mean, we can use any pair of parameters, A1 and A2. But of course, we want to have our parameters such that there is no classification error in this example. So, and the solution is not unique, as you can see. So this line is a good solution. This line is a good solution too. This line is a good solution too. But this line is not good. Yeah. Okay, and uh, yeah, obviously, um, this only works ver very well if our data are linearly separable. Yeah? Um, now, th this is the formula for such an n-dimensional hyperplane in our n-dimensional space. I have a, a linear combination of my variables with these parameters and this linear combination is equal to some constant theta. Huh? <coughs> Actually, we don't need this theta. What, what we had here before, it was equal to 1. But, I mean, of course, we can always make this equal to 1. How? We just divide the whole equation by theta, and then these coefficients are scaled, and we have a 1 on the right-hand side. So that's equivalent. Yeah? And now, um, two sets of data, M1 and M2, are called linearly separable, if there are such real numbers, A1 through An and theta, um, such that this linear combination is greater than theta for all x in uh, set M1, and it's less than or equal to theta for all x's in the other class. Huh? Yeah. I mean, the intuition behind this is um, all the points in M1, they are above the line, and all the points in M2 are below the line. Okay, now let's look at two examples. Again, we have a two-dimensional space, and here we have three uh, points in M1 and one point in M2 and they are linearly separable. The interesting thing here is these points, they correspond to the logical AND function. So if we take two Boolean variables, x1 and x2, and uh, x1 and x2 is true if they both have the value 1, and it is false in all other three cases. No? Okay. So the, the logical AND function, the Boolean AND function, is linearly separable, as you can see here. And there are infinitely many solutions. This line also uh, is perfect, and this one, this one too. But the XOR function is not linearly separable. And that's why XOR is quite interesting for machine learning. Um, x1, x or x2 is true if x1 is 1 and x2 is 0 and uh, symmetrically, but it is false if both have the same value. And so uh, a separation of the two classes can be obtained, for example, by this curve. Huh? Or, I mean, you could also use a curve like this. But there is no chance with a linear combination um, to separate these two classes with no error. Of course we can use this line, 
but then um, this uh, data point uh, will have a false classification. Okay, and now we talk about the perceptron. The perceptron is the it's nothing but a linear classifier. And uh, so to conclude this lecture, we just look at this definition. And this definition is extremely simple because it's nothing but a linear combination of our features. We have a weight vector, W1 through Wn, and a perceptron represents a function P from our n-dimensional feature space to the z0,1. Huh? And p of x is 1 if the linear combination, what we have here, the sum wi xi is greater than 0. So in this case, if the linear combination is greater than 0, or in other words, if our points are above this line, then the perceptron gives as an output a 1, otherwise it gives a 0 as, as an output. So the perceptron does nothing but uh, separate the plane into two halves, in that half above the line and in the other half below the line. And of course this sum can be written as the product of a vector w times a vector x. Um, yes, and what's quite interesting too is this zero here. Before we had a one or a theta, now we have a zero here. In, in case of two dimensions, what does that mean um, for our line? The separating line in two dimensions, how does it look like? It is a straight line, yes, but uh, it's a special straight line. I mean, it's always a straight line. Even with the theta, it's a straight line. How does the straight line look like if we have a zero on the right-hand side? Oh, let's look at it. Uh, A1, X1 plus A2, X2 is equal to zero. How does such a straight line look like? I mean, we have a2 x2 is equal to minus a1 x1. x2 is equal to minus a1 divided by a2. Um, yeah, times x1. How does that line look like? It's a straight line through the origin. Oh, sorry, through the origin. Huh? Okay, so what our perceptron does is separate the plane in two halves, or maybe the line may look like that. And in case of, that, of this line, there is one half above and the other one below, but it's no longer possible for example, what we had with the XOR example. This is no longer possible. So the perceptron, as we have it here, is able to separate the plane just by rotating such a line. And we will, uh, tomorrow morning, we will see how this perceptron automatically adjusts these parameters given a data set. Okay, thank you.